Yeah. All right, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Stefan Schmidt. I'm the research paper lead for this year's conference. And uh, I'm very happy to welcome all of you to the event today, brought to you uh, by the Major League Baseball, who was so kind to um, give us the means to give out a prize money of $9,000 today, of which the big prize of $5,000 will go to the winner of this competition. Um, before I give it over to our first speakers, I want to make sure that you uh, are aware of two things. Number one, this whole experience was uh, made possible by a, by a large team of students, and this research paper competition specifically was made possible by Carolina Vergara, Nikhil Bjanja, Jameson Soibel, and uh, Jeremy Scharf, um, whom I'd like to thank at, at this point. Um, and you should do that too. Thank you. And number two, the finalists for tomorrow's research paper finals will actually be determined by an audience vote. Um, you can vote via our app in Attendify. Um, you can scan any of these QR codes. The code on the very right will lead you to the vote for this um, research paper presentation semifinals. The one in the middle will lead you to the vote for our research poster competition, which is happening among all the posters that you see in our West Balcony pre-function when you enter the room. So make sure to vote on those as well. And if you want to have a read on the full papers that are presented to you today and that you can see on the posters, um, feel free to check out the papers on our website. And now, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Evan Monroe, who will talk about a no-tanking draft allocation. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Evan. I'm a PhD student at Stanford. And I'll be going through um, a work which talks about a better way to design draft allocation policy for sports leagues in the US. And this is joint work with Martino, who's a fellow PhD student at Stanford. So just to start off, we're going to narrow our focus just a little bit for this presentation. Um, the first is we're going to focus on the NBA in terms of the data that we look at, uh, because the problem of tanking, which is, you know, for most of you probably know what tanking is, but it's where teams intentionally lose in order to try to get themselves a better draft pick. Um, it's considered most intractable in the NBA because of the importance of key players in the NBA. Um, and the second thing is we're going to just focus on the allocation of the first draft pick. Uh, it makes things a lot more simple, but our, our framework's easily extended to cover the whole draft. Um, if you have questions about that, I'm, I'm happy to answer it. So a little bit of background. Every year, um, the NBA allocates the first draft pick through a lottery that favors the teams with the worst records in the previous season. So before 1985, it was the conference losers there was just a coin flip uh, between the two conference losers. So if you were the worst team in the league, you had a 50% chance of getting the first draft pick. You can imagine at that time they had a lot of issues with teams losing intentionally towards the end of the season to try to compete for that draft pick. So in 1985, they changed the system really drastically. And it went from having a 50% chance to actually they changed it to a lottery that was equal for every non-playoff team. Um, and so then if you were the worst team at that time, the probability of getting the first draft pick dropped uh, depending on the number of teams in the league, from between 11 and 14%. Um, but the problem with that system was that the redistributive properties of the draft were weakened. And so now um, you had an issue where you know, a team that just missed the playoffs had an equal chance of getting the draft pick as the team that was ranked last, which you know, hurt the redistributive properties of the draft, which people like. Um, and we'll talk about why. And so again, it was increased in 1990 to 17%. 1994, they increased it again to 25%. And then they dropped it back down last year uh, to 14%. So looking at this, the NBA is trying to solve for something. And you can see this these similar things happening in the NHL as well. Um, and we're going to go in and try to think a little bit more about what they're solving for, why they seem to be having difficulty solving for it, and then what we might be able to do about it. So the first thing we're going to write down is what the league objectives are. Um, and so we're backing this out from the statements that the league's made when they've changed the system, um, as well as you know, how they've changed the system over, over time. So the first league objective is that we want to maximize the probability that the lowest ranked team received the highest draft pick. 
So we can imagine in a world where there was no issues with tanking, we would just hand the draft pick to the person who was ranked last in the season. That's what we're assuming kind of the best case scenario is. But we know that there's this problem where teams might intentionally lose in order to increase their draft pick odds if we give the draft with too high a probability to the lowest ranked team under the current system. Um, and so we want to constrain our primary objective, which is to favor the worst team in the league, um, by eliminating any incentives to tank. And the justification for this is, you know, if you're at the end of the season and a bunch of teams are competing to be at the bottom of the league, that's going to hurt your TV ratings, it's going to hurt attendance in the game. And the justification for actually wanting to give the draft pick, I mean, that's really up to the league, but you can imagine if you don't, if it's just a pure market process for allocating new players, the teams that do well in one year, they have more cash to bid for new players, and you could end up in a scenario over the long term where you have good teams in the league and bad teams in the league, and not as much competition, and it's less exciting for fans and such. Now, the question is, how well are these objectives being met very well? So we, so we saw that right now the lowest ranked team in the league is getting the draft pick with 14% probability. So that's not actually very high. So I'd argue that the first objective, which is the redistribution objective, isn't actually being met very well currently. And uh, no matter how many times the draft has been changed, you know, there's still constant chatter in the news and on sports blogs and on Reddit about what teams are tanking and what teams should be tanking and whether or not the strategy will be successful. So I'd argue that right now neither objective is, is being met very well. And, um, and, it, and there's even a question over whether it's even possible to satisfy both objectives. So this is in the context of the hockey draft from Greg Wyshynski, and his quote, which I think captures kind of the research question in this paper really well, is, if you don't want tanking, then essentially you don't want the welfare mechanism that encourages it. So if you're anti-tank, you might as well be pro-draft abolishment. So we're going to dive into this and figure out, is this true, or under what scenarios is this true? So this is uh, not the first time someone's tried to come up with an alternative draft policy. So first of all, there's actual work which has gone in and looked at the win-loss records of teams over time and shown that it's not just something that people are imagining or people, like, the, statistically, teams that have the incentives to lose towards the end of the season are losing more than teams that don't have the incentives to lose. So there's actual identification that tanking is a real problem in the NBA. And there's been some suggestions of alternative draft rules, I think some of which have been presented at this conference before. So there's the Tombstone rule, which was Adam Gold, and there's Linton Smith and Boys who were thinking of a different kind of lottery, which was uh, determined earlier in the season. So what's new about, or like why I want you to pay attention to our paper, I think what's interesting about our approach is we're going to actually write out a mathematical environment for the league. So what's the league objective? What's the team's objective? And from this, we're going to use like the simple tools from game theory and from mechanism design to figure out what kind of draft policy is possible and what kind of draft policy is actually optimal given the objectives that we wrote down for the league and for, and for teams. Um, and so, you know, this is like an analytics conference and a lot of people are looking at data and we're also going to be looking at data. But what's nice about theory is it's able to narrow down exactly what we should be looking for in the data and actually figure out, well, there may not even be, there may not even be any point in looking at a certain class of mechanisms because they don't work. Um, and so that, we'll, we'll go into a little bit more about what that means. So as I described, our research question is, is it possible to design a lottery that favors the worst team but eliminates all incentives for tanking? And our first answer is that Greg Wyshynski is correct under the current system. So under a lottery that's based only on final ranking, so only on teams' win-loss records, it's impossible. If you, have, if you favor the worst team at all, there's always going to be some incentives to tank. And now you can minimize those incentives by not favoring the worst team, or if you just go to a uniform lottery like they did in 1985 to 1989, you can remove the incentives to tank. But otherwise, it's impossible. And so that's a very negative result. But the good thing is, is that, is that if you make the lottery based on when the wins and losses happen, rather than just the final rankings, then it actually is possible to favor the worst team and also like remove incentives to tank. And I'll go into the details um, about how that works and why that works. So there's a, lot, there's a lot of like math in the paper. It's not very complicated, but I only have 20 minutes, so we're not going to have any of the notation or any of the formal structures that we have in the paper. But if you're interested in that or want to ask questions about that, you know, the paper is online, and I'm also happy to talk about it. So instead, I'm just going to go through kind of the intuition and the kind of moving pieces that come together uh, so that we use to kind of put together our proofs about the results that we have. Um, so the first 
is a simple model of team decision making. And we're going to imagine that teams are just competing for two things. We're going to abstract from a lot of the complications of like what actually happens. And we're going to assume that teams care about either making the playoffs, which is valued at some fixed value, or getting the first draft pick, which is valued at another fixed value. So these are the two prizes that team cares about. One plays playoffs, and, and two is the draft pick. And so from this kind of simplified environment, um, we, we say that teams either, either attempt to win or attempt to lose. And the way they may make that decision is through this no tanking condition, which is very intuitive. It's that the benefit from winning a game should always be greater than equal to the benefit from losing a game. And the benefit from winning a game is that the probability I make the playoffs goes up or doesn't change, and that the probability I get the draft pick goes down under the current system. And if I attempt to lose, the probability of getting the draft pick goes up, and the probability of getting, making the playoffs goes down. And we're going to show that under the current system, that no tanking condition doesn't, doesn't hold in a lot of scenarios. And we can show that through like a really simple example, is that if our lottery is fixed in advance, and it favors the team with the worst records. Now, after a team's been eliminated from the playoffs, their probability of making the playoffs is, is now zero. So at this point, in any games that affect their final ranking, losing improves their odds in the draft because it increases the probability that they're going to they're be ranked lower. And so what they should actually do is up to the point of getting some penalty from the league, because the league does occasionally penalize teams under particularly egregious cases, they should be actually trying to lose in every game post-elimination that affects their final ranking if they only care about making the playoffs or getting the draft pick. And so under the current system, tanking is unavoidable. Even if I make the lottery just favor the worst teams in the, just a tiny little bit, a rational team should, towards the end of the season, if there's a, a game that's important for their final rankings, they should try to, they should try to lose that game. Um, what can we do instead? So our policy makes the draft lottery dependent on what happens in the season every season. And so what it does is after every game, we re-estimate the probabilities that every team will be ranked last after the season concludes. So what does that mean? If I start out at the beginning of the season, no games have been played yet, and maybe, I, maybe just for purposes of this example, I assume that everyone has equal ability. So before any games have been played, there's an equal probability that any given team ends up last in the season, because every game you can just think about it like a coin flip. Now, as games come in and results kind of accumulate over the course of the season, then more certainty happens about what happens towards the end of the, yeah, by the end of the season. So if I go on a 10-game losing streak while other, game, uh, other teams are accumulating wins and losses, my, posterior, my conditional probability, given the games that have happened so far, of ending up last in the season goes up. So then my draft probability goes up under our current system. So you can imagine we start with equal draft probabilities for everyone, and every game that comes in, we adjust those draft probabilities. Now, if we kept doing that for the whole season, by the end of the season, we would just hand the draft pick to the person who ended up ranked last. But of course, if we do that, we're going to end up with the same tanking issues that you have under the, under the current system. So our process involves freezing the draft probabilities at some point in the season. But we can't just pick a stopping time in advance of the season before we know, know, know what happens, because it depends when does the losing streak happen for the worst team. And the incentives to win and lose change depending on who the draft is that season and what exactly happens in that season. So we choose the stopping time or when the draft probabilities are frozen dynamically depending on what happens in the season. Um, and, and what's nice about this is that because we're targeting, the draft probabilities are actually matching the probabilities that people end up last in the season, conditional on the games that happen so far. In expectation, we're going to give the draft pick to the lowest ranked team with the highest probability. And we're also removing incentives, at least in our model, um, within, within a season to tank. And so you know, one thing that this might do is that it might increase incentives for a team to go on a rebuilding streak, which is where they actually spend multiple seasons trying to, you know, bringing down the, the value of their team and trying to get good draft picks. We're not considering like, the rebuilding strategy here. We're considering just the tanking strategy, which is something that people decide in the middle of a season, OK, I'm going to lose from now on, not that I'm going to lose for the entire season. Uh, just, just to be clear about what, you know, what we're th the problem we're thinking about solving using this rule. OK, so I'm going to show some examples now of um, how the draft rule worked in the 1980s. And the reason I'm going to start with the 1980s, you might think, OK, why are you showing me 1980s data? I, I don't care about that. It's a long time ago. Is that in the 1980s, they had another draft rule, which was also not encouraging tanking, which was the uniform lottery. Um, and so what's nice about that is our 
model also doesn't encourage tanking. And so the estimate of what our um, draft rule would have done in the 1980s is an unbiased estimate, meaning like people's behavior would have been the same under the NBA lottery that year and our lottery that year. So I'm going to start out with that, and then I'll also show you some more recent years. But the more recent years are tainted by the fact that the current rule encourages tanking. Um, hopefully that makes sense, and happy to ask, uh, answer more questions about that. So in 1989, the Miami Heat was the, was the worst team in the league. And under the lottery that year, everyone got the draft, first draft pick with equal probability. But the Miami Heat, under our rule, actually gets the first draft pick with 44% probability without encouraging tanking in that and I'll, in the next slide, I'll show you exactly how that works. Now, you can also see like someone like Pacers, who didn't end up doing all that badly that year, also has a high draft probability. And that's because we're freezing the draft probability at some point in the season. And the ranking at that point in the season determines the draft. And if the you know, Indiana Pacers ended up going on a winning streak towards the end of the season, which didn't count towards adjusting their draft probability. But our goal, we don't care so much about the rest. Our goal is to target the last ranked team with as high probability as possible, and, and that we've done that very well here. So what, how did that actually look like, or how did the draft you know, probability evolution process that I described to you on the, on, the, on the more theoretical slide work in practice? So at the beginning, we're modeling that um, you know, everyone has about the same chance as coming of coming last. Then the Heat go on a massive losing streak at the beginning of the season. Um, and what is, in, you know, what is nice about uncertainty context of sports, often economics uncertainty is a bad thing. But if you're trying to give a prize to someone who does badly, uncertainty is actually a good thing. Because at the beginning of the season, nobody really knows where they're going to end up because none of the results are in yet. So the heat, it's very unlikely they're going to be losing to target the, the draft at that early time. So those losses really mean something. And we should be, they really are giving a good signal that this is a bad team and not a team that's just losing to, to, to kind of capture a draft probability. So we, we take advantage that the incentives to lose are much weaker at the beginning of the season. We address the draft probability quite a lot over the first 300 games. But then, once there's more certainty in the season, the Miami Heat can forecast and say, well, conditional on me having lost all these games at the beginning of the season, there's now a very high chance I'm not going to make the playoffs. And their incentives to win suddenly drop you know, drastically as we, go, as we move from the 200th to the 300th game. And we're going to model in, our, in the simulation of the rules around the 330th game the, the incentives to win, if we kept adjusting the way that we've been adjusting, would start to dominate um, the, the incentives to lose, would start to dominate the incentives to win. So from that point forward, the draft probabilities are frozen. But that big winning streak, or that big losing streak, is very important. Like the Miami Heat aren't going to recover from that. So they, you know, even though we, we, we froze the draft probabilities a third of the way through the season, they still ended up the last, uh, the last team in the league, which is what we're proving in the theory, and then we show it actually happens in practice. Um, so maybe you think I've just cherry-picked a year and, you know, it doesn't always look this good. So I'm going to also try to break the rule and, and put it in a scenario that's really kind of challenging for, for the rule. Um, who knows who this is? Yes, that's right. So this guy was really valuable and everybody wanted him. And there was even talk that the Knicks cheated in the draft lottery in order to get him by freezing some of the draft uh, lottery balls. So. Let's assume we're, you know, in the rest of the presentation, we're assuming that the value of making the playoffs is actually greater than the value of the draft pick, and that lets us take into account a lot of games in the season. But let's assume that the value that year of Patrick Ewing was actually like pretty much the same as the value of making the playoffs. Like people really wanted this guy, and really were gonna, you know, take advantage of and game the system in any way they could get him. So our rule takes that into account, and in this case, we actually don't, we really can't do that much better than the NBA lottery, because we know the incentives to lose in this season are really high, because everyone wants Patrick Ewing, and we only take into account the first 100 games in the season, so the first handful of games that teams play in at the beginning of the season, and we still actually give the draft to the Indiana Pacers with the highest probability, with a 19% probability, but you can see the, the results not as drastic as we had in the case where we were able to take, take much more games into, into account. Um, so here, this is my slide showing, you know, this is what can go wrong, and in my opinion, what goes wrong here isn't so bad. You know, we still give the draft with the strength person with the highest probability, but we're not able to have such a, such a skewed distribution as we did in the case where the, the draft pick isn't worth, worth as much. 
So now, oh, again, I mentioned, I mentioned the issues with, you know, the, the, in the 2019, the final rankings might have been different under our rule because we don't encourage tanking as much as the current rule. But this is what our rule looks like anyway for that season. And what happens is the Phoenix Suns, the second last team, actually gets the draft with the highest probability. Uh, because the Knicks, a lot of their losses came towards the end of the season. I'm not saying whether they were tanking or not, but it just happened that they won more games at the beginning of the season, and so their losses didn't count towards the, towards the draft um, in, 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 in 2019. Um, but what I think is also really nice about this is, like, if you look at what, how the current NBA lottery looks like, the other seven non-playoff teams that aren't towards the bottom of the league have a pretty high probability of getting the draft. It's like 18.5% probability, which is like arguably too high, like one in five chance that someone that was way above, uh, just because we have so many teams in the NBA, NBA now, uh, was way above the bottom teams in the league and did much better than the bottom teams, teams in the league might get the draft bang. Um, and in, in our case, those, when even after, you know, after 350 games, which is again, not even close to half the season, the probability that any of those other seven non-playoff teams ended up last in the season was only 5% across all of them. And so our rule you know, doesn't give the draft to those teams with any like, meaningful probability. And I think that's a, a good feature. Um, so overall, we're using game theory rather than you know, statistical analysis here to prove what kind of rule can favor the worst team in a season without providing any incentives to tank. And the key insight is that you, know, you want the benefit from winning to be greater than or equal to benefit from losing in every game. And in order for that to be the case, you know, you should count games earlier in the season more than the season. And you can do this in a way by thinking about how important the early games are for what happens later in the season that you still target the, who, the team who ends up worst in the season. Um, and we also, like, we take this, we take our rule to the data. We, we you know, in the paper, we have a bunch of simulations which show how, you know, how much the rule gains over, over the current rule and over, over the uniform rule. And we find that the rule performs very well in practice. So it favors the worst team with a provided incentives to thank. Um, and that's it. We have five minutes left for questions. Sorry, I'm coming to you with a mic. My hands are trenched in disinfectant, so no worries. Oh, great job. Really, really interesting. The question would be, what if there were some other reason why a team was bad early in the year? LeBron James misses the first half of the year. The team's record is suppressed. And then he comes back. But by then, um, it's changed, or you acquire somebody in a trade. Could, could you get a skewed view of what the, how bad the, or good the team really is? Yeah, so I think a lot of this depends on simulating the rest of the season pretty well. So people do that in betting markets. People do that uh, you know, in the existing draft simulators that, it, that, that exist. So whatever process that you're using to simulate the rest of the season should be trying to take into account factors like someone coming back into the season if those are known. Now, if those aren't known and something really random happens, then yes, and the team has knowledge of that and the league doesn't have knowledge of that, then you're right that there could still be some opportunity to game in that scenario. But for the most part, you hope that, you know, how do you want to actually implement this mechanism in practice? Maybe you take an average of forecasts from multiple web websites. Maybe you have an open source tool that you know, people can see exactly how the forecasting is happening. And so, so you're right that there could be scenarios where the lead forecast is off from the team forecast, and that could cause problems. But we'd argue that you know, these things matter, and you know, there's money involved with who wins and who loses. So there's a lot of information going around that should help you make good forecasts on what's going to happen. Uh, great job. This is super interesting. Um, would you have any worry that this would kind of reorient incentives around teams that maybe perceive that they don't have a chance of a title intentionally losing at the beginning of seasons, especially it seems in the NBA there may be eight to 10 teams that really have no realistic title hope going into a season. Yeah, so, so that, that goes that? into what I briefly mentioned about the rebuilding strategy and the issues where this maybe would increase in incentives to go to a rebuilding strategy. Now, one way you could change that is by, this is, tells me what's optimal, but maybe we say, well, there's too many moving parts. I don't actually want to adjust the lottery every year. But what at least this lets you do is I could go back and figure out what the optimal rule was on every last season and then calculate what the average optimal rule was. And just, that's our optimal rule, we freeze that, and then we can calculate exactly how much of an incentive that provides for people to do this rebuilding strategy or not. So then we know that someone's not gonna, well, I know if I lose the first 30 games in the season, I'm gonna get the draft pick with 100% probability. We know because it's frozen based on what the average one was before we put the rule in, in practice. So, so two questions, I think it's an elegant solution to the in-game in-season in tanking problem, so good work on that. I, I think 
part of the problem, though, that you and they have been alluding to is that the, the goal of the draft probably isn't to award the top pick to the worst team, right? It's to redistribute talent in some way. And so, you know, this is going to have the effect of just more really badly constructed teams so that you don't, you, you wouldn't want to win um, during the season. But that's a separate issue, I guess. Um, my question is how sensitive is the model to the valuation of the playoffs and the draft picks? And how would you decide how to value that when you're setting the model up? It's, it's very sensitive around one. So like if they're equal, going from one to two, it's very sensitive. But once you get to three, four, five, the, 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 the difference kind of flattens but, out. But so, so I if think, you were putting this into place practically, how would, you, how would you tell the league to decide what the value is relative of make, the relative values of making the playoffs versus... So you'd you'd have to do some data work. So you'd look at when, what, are, what are the valuations when people are selling first round draft picks. That could give you some approximate valuation of what a draft pick is worth. And you'd look at you know, some identification of how teams' fortunes change you know, with whether they made the boundary of making the playoffs or not making the playoffs in terms of TV revenues and such. But I mean, that number, all it has to be, I could set it to, to, to two, and as long as I know, it just has to be a bound. You know? as long as it, it doesn't have to be exactly right. As long as the, the true number is, is greater than that number I put into the rule, then I know I'm not going to encourage tanking. But. All right, we have time for one last question, maybe from this side. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I was wondering, you mostly talked about just calibrating this sort of rule towards the top number one pick versus the playoffs. Um, if there are draft classes where maybe it's not just the top player, but there's like a group of two or three or even more, there might still be incentives to tank for the two or three or four pick uh, or just top picks in general. So how would you think about maybe generalizing this sort of a rule to include more than just the top pick? Um, and if so, how, how do you think that that might uh, work out mathematically? So, so right now our setup is really general. All we have to do is have a benefit from losing and a benefit from winning. And so if we had some kind of sequential lottery, you know, like they have currently where probabilities are redistributed after the first draft picks allocated based on who didn't win and so on, we can calculate then what the change in value is assuming that there's sequential draft picks allocated. It just makes that right-hand side part of like what's the benefit from losing more complicated. And you just add, you know, I now know that if I don't win the first draft pick, I have a certain probability of winning the second draft pick. And that, and, you know, again, you have to assume some bound on the value of that draft pick. And you add that up as a sum instead of just a single term. And so we have that um, in an appendix of the paper. It's just like the notation is a little more complicated and stuff. But it shouldn't be, the, the conceptual issues don't change. All right, thank you very much. Please give it up for Evan Munro. And next up will be Neil Johnson at 12.15 p.m. Thank you.